Welcome to Second Edition Science Experiment. Let's go see how our experiments are progressing. Good idea, Hannah. Access granted. Access granted. The news team looks good. Looks like Lisa has everything under control. Looks like they're on track, Bernard. Yeah, it looks like they are. Bernard, what do we have planned in our electronic field production lab today? According to the charts, we are experimenting on what it takes to synthesize the perfect show, and we are experimenting with the in vitro food machine. Interesting. I was just over at the anatomy lab, and it looks like doctors Michaela and Andrew are up to something. Okay, perfect. Our virologist, Dr. Lisa, is experimenting with the latest highly contagious video. According to my calculations, in order to create a balanced news segment, we have to add in a dash of urgency. And don't forget the 10 milliliters of human interest. Bernard, don't forget to incorporate proximity. And finally, I will just infuse some objectivity and some interviews in it. Oh my, it's working! This week on Second Edition News. The city denies Nate's SU pass request. Nate tackles student stress. New numbers on the Edmonton homeless. Welcome to Second Edition News. I'm Taylor Petty. And I'm Ben Matichuk. Nate students received more frustrating news about the LRT situation this week when the city of Edmonton denied Nate's request to waive Nate's student's U-Pass fees when the LRT is finally running. It wasn't uh, fair fair to, to the mayor and maybe he, he, didn't, he didn't find that it was, it was a reasonable request. The referendum to make U-Pass fees mandatory at Nate was posed in the 2012-2013 school year and passed, with 78% of students in favor, but the LRT was one of its biggest selling points. At that time, the train was supposed to be running by April 2014, and that has been pushed back 10 months since. We are very happy that he took his time to get back to us on, uh, on the letter that we sent out, but at the same time, hopefully, we are, we are hoping to work on, multi on different initiatives in the future with him. With the wait getting longer, NATSA requested a U-Pass fee relief for the upcoming winter semester, but it and the students were sorely disappointed when Mayor Iveson declined the inquiry. Until the LRT is running, the Ook Express will continue to be the city's way of apologizing for the delay. Post-secondary schooling can be quite the experience, but some students have been feeling stressed, prompting NATSA to do something about it. Through various observations by Nate's Mental Health Awareness Committee and Counseling Center, it was discovered that students are feeling the pressure to succeed in all areas of their lives. Starting in the second week of December, students will start seeing leaflets in the men's and women's bathrooms that are located near study areas. These leaflets contain information about dealing with stress or depression. Jillian Wilson, Vice President of Student Services and fellow colleagues, plan to hand out stress balls, earplugs and neck pillows, among many other things. Nate received $39,000 from a grant funded by the government for mental health initiatives, which has helped make those items and events possible. But if we can create awareness of where to find those services, but also decrease the number of severity cases that students are reporting uh, as you know, indicating whether or not they feel suicidal or uh, instances of stress or depression, if we can lower um, the instances that we have on campus by even one student, then it'll be completely worthwhile. The High Five campaign posters are put up to indicate a judgment-free zone for those who struggle and or experience mental health. Students and staff can find these posters in the Academic Success Centre, along with decals and buttons to show support. If you need someone to talk to, call 1-877-303-2642 for the Mental Health Line or 780-482-4357 for the Crisis Distress Line. After conducting five years of what Homeward Trust calls the goal to end homelessness in 10 years, the organization addressed the media on Friday with an update on the stats for homelessness in Edmonton. I want to thank um, my staff, Robbie Bryden and Gary Puligandla, for their work on the data. 
In 2009, both the City of Edmonton and the Government of Alberta launched 10-year plans to end homelessness, and the funding from the Government of Alberta allowed Homeward Trust to start its Housing First program. We know Housing First works and changes lives for the better. Due to this, in large part, we have seen a decrease in Edmonton's homeless population as registered in both the 2010 and 2012 counts. McGee reports that the number of those homeless increased over the past two years for a total of almost 2,300 people. The Edmonton population increased by 7.4% in that time and homelessness 3.5%. The CEO calls this neither a cause for celebration nor for alarm, but an affirmation of results and a reminder of the work still ahead. Not only are they firefighters, but these people can handle some tricky situations. Whenever emergency services receives a call that involves steep embankments or high angles, they are quick to send out Edmonton's technical rescue team. We'll figure it out. The technical rescue team as a group has 90 members, but when out facing a task, they only require eight. The members are trained firefighters with a seniority of four years. This particular exercise was for high angle training, which makes members of the team work with forces and weight, creating the perfect balance to bring down a patient. Corey Selby, the technical rescue coordinator, let us know what it takes to join the team. We only take so many every so often, right? But just the willingness, you know, to try new things, like just to get up the guts to climb up, this is not for everybody, right? But anybody willing to try new things, right? It's, it's just nice to be part of this, this team. It's an exciting part of our job, right, that not everybody gets to do. The team meets up four times a year for different training exercises such as high angle, embankment and structure. This helps them prepare for the mix of situations they may encounter in the future. They've already faced rescues from cranes, cell phone towers, and bridges. In 2013, 23 high angle rescue calls were made and the team responded to each one. The city recognized more than 200 people at City Hall on Tuesday night, with 12 citizens receiving citation awards and many athletes being honored as well. The Salute to Excellence has been held every year since 1951, and it reveres citizens who have given more than five years of volunteer service or are inspirational leaders in the areas of arts, culture, sports, and community service. It also recognizes athletes who have gained success at a national or international level. This is a very, very special night for Edmontonians and their families who are being recognized, but it's also um, wonderful for us on City Council because we get the chance to shake hands with and be inspired by everyday Edmontonians. Mayor Iveson was the first to shake each person's hand as they walked on stage. November 20th was declared National Child Day here in the city at the Boyle Street Centre. Children of all ages gathered together to celebrate their right to play, reminding adults that all work and no play makes for a long day. Today we are celebrating National Child's Day. And to us, we feel like it's just as, as simple as Child's Play. Councillor Michael Walters joined the children in proclaiming National Child Day and reminded Edmontonians that it is important that we ensure as a community that old children are protected and act primarily in the best interest of them. An early childhood development tool was used in Edmonton and it was found that 33% of kindergartners are experiencing great difficulty, which is 8% higher than the national average. The Circle of Courage group offered insight on what National Child Day means to them. It gives the kids a chance to have fun. And I think children shouldn't be trapped inside. They should be able to go outside and play instead of on electronics every single hour. No, it's just important, I guess. Important because we are still a young child. Other speakers joined Councillor Walters in celebrating the day. Elder Mary Cardinal Collins offered a prayer of gratitude for the children in hopes that they will forever play. The Children and Youth Advocate of Alberta, Del Graff, emphasized that the right to play and learn are essential for our children of our future because it encourages innovation, creativity, and adaptability. Dane joins us in studio for sports. What do we have for this week? Thanks guys. I've got some highlights of the women's hockey team, some CFL news, and more. The Ukes look to bounce back from their overtime loss to Red Deer last game, this time with home ice advantage. We pick up midway through the first with the point shot from Caitlin Whaley, which is tipped by Jody Rammel, but Summer Roberts gets down and keeps it scoreless. A little later, Brianna Frasca with the puck. She feeds it into the slot for Kuzilova, but Roberts is there again with the pad. After the second period with some encouraging tickles, and we're good to go. Megan Goble with the wrister from the point. That gets tipped by Shorts, then Tibbets on net, but Roberts gets the left pad out. 
Red Deer with some pressure. Megan Jones tries to go far side, but is denied by the glove of Tanil Guard. Third period. Sky Fallman flies in, but can't sneak it by the aptly named guard. Susie Vanderlind gets some speed up the wing, but has the puck poked away in a beauty of a play by Carly Reeve. Still scoreless. After a quick chat, it's time for overtime. Brianna Frasca dangles past the D, finds a slot, and fires it past Roberts to win the game for the Ukes. They improve their impressive season with their sixth win in eight games. They're currently first in the ACAC with a 6-1-1 record. Sherry Bowles shares her thoughts we on the game. We really came back from our performance last night. We struggled uh, at our game yesterday, so as a team we knew we needed to improve and we needed to be better and follow our game plan, and I think that our team really focused on our objectives. The 102nd Grey Cup kicks off this Sunday with Hamilton facing Calgary. The Ticats ended the regular season with a 9-9 record while the Stampeders finished 15-3. We'll have our eyes on Bo Levi Mitchell and Brandon Banks this Sunday. Mitchell tossed four touchdown passes to help defeat Edmonton last Sunday, while Banks took a pair of punts to the end and squashed Montreal's Grey Cup hopes. Pickoff is 4 p.m. Mountain Time at BC Place in Vancouver. As the Eskimos gather their thoughts after the 43-18 season-ending loss to Calgary, the organization reflects on their efforts. We've got really good players across the border. We wouldn't have won the games that we won. Um, we're going to look at what deficiencies or what we feel like we can improve our football team, and, the, and at the adequate time, we'll do it. Me, him, John White, Kendall Lawrence, you know, Mike Riley, like, that's one of the best offenses in the league to me, you know what I mean? But um, I just felt like we could have done more. We're not, we're not satisfied. Uh, we need to build and continue because consistency is what this community is used to. You know, we have to make certain that when we go into the 2015 season that we, we don't look back on this year and say, you know, hey, we, we did a great job and kick our feet up, but challenge ourselves to improve and, uh, and, and push to uh, you know, be a better football team and continue to grow as an organization. Edmonton Rush hit the field for training camp this past weekend as they hope to take the positives from last year and finish big. Their 2015 season should be just as dominant, if not better. Last season, they finished with the best record in the history of the league at 16-2, as well as the second most goals. To try to help continue this trend, they acquired Ben McIntosh first overall and hope that their star goalie Aaron Bold stays strong in net. Tyler Codron looks forward to returning after two years off to pursue his firefighting career. After uh, two seasons off, I feel a little old, like the older guy, but uh, it feels nice to be back and, and playing lacrosse again in, uh, in Edmonton. Well, unfortunately, the Esks didn't make it, but I think the Rush will do pretty well, judging by last season. Thanks, Dane. And this has been Second Edition News and Sports. That was a splendid newscast. It had all the right elements. My Bachelor of Communications and my PhD in Science Technology sure came in handy, eh? My Bachelor of Broadcast Journalism and Masters in Science played a bigger role, wouldn't you say? I'm pretty sure I'm more knowledgeable with that. Average person eats 430 bucks per year by accident through their food. Ah! Did you know a lightning bolt contains enough energy to toast 100,000 pieces of bread? Did you know Maya Bialik, who plays Amy off of The Big Bang Theory, had a career in neuroscience? Did you know the average human brain takes in 11 million bytes of information every second, but is only aware of 40? Did you know Bill Nye is also an inventor? He holds a patent for a special kind of ballet slipper and a magnifying glass. Did you know the world's oceans contain 20 million tons of gold? I love science facts, but it's time to experiment with the in vitro food machine. Wow, that didn't work out. Maybe we should take a break and leave it to the experts at Ernest. Don't go anywhere. There's more to come. Looking to get out more? <sighs> Tune in to NR92 for all your campus events. The time of your life is just to listen away. NR92.com, the station for the students. Hey there, lady. What are you doing? Oh, you're making a drink. Having a little trouble with that ice? Here, let me take that ice. Really, it's no problem. 
rhythm and I grab my traditional and give it a little bang, bang, bang. That's right, I'm breaking the ice with a big rock. There, done. You're welcome. Oh my, you're still gonna make that girly drink, eh? Oops. Here, have a big rock instead. Touch it. Here's to you, little lady. Be traditional. Break the ice with a big rock. Or you can wait for it to melt. Choice. You can choose excitement or relaxation. Work All right. or play. Your choice can result in mistakes and successes. But the choice is always yours. Big Rock. Choose your own adventure. Hello and welcome to Cooking with Ernest. My name is Bernard Siren. Today we're joined by Chef Josh Ward. And Josh, um, I love chocolate, but I always burn the chocolate while melting them. Do you have a solution for me? We do, yeah. You could uh, use a double boiler. This is what we're going to be using today. It's basically just a pot of uh, shallow water on medium temperature. Uh, so that basically is an indirect heat. You never want to use a direct heat when, it's, uh, when it comes to chocolate because then it will burn. Um, this basically just helps uh, distribute the, uh, the heat evenly. Um, so yeah, what we're actually going to be doing today is we're going to be tempering the chocolate. And can you tell me, what does tempering chocolate mean? So tempering basically will strengthen the chocolate. So you're basically melting it to a certain temperature. So we're using dark chocolate today and you want to melt that to about 110 to 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and then when you temper it, you basically are dropping the temperature, uh, which uh, forms the, the, the good fat crystals. So there's fat crystals in all chocolates. Um, but what we're going to be doing is we actually have about 500 grams of chocolate. So I've taken out 25%. Um, so now that the chocolate's up to the right temperature, we're going to add the unmelted chocolate. And why do you melt the 25% later on? Uh, because what that does is it introduces, because most chocolate already comes tempered. So what this is going to do is it's going to introduce the good fat crystals and also drop the temperature itself. Uh, so the more you agitate it like I'm doing now, it actually distributes the fat crystals throughout all of the chocolate. And can I add any spice to chocolate while I'm melting it? Um, not when you're tempering, no, because it throws off the ratios. Um, you can always make a ganache, which is like a filling for a chocolate. Uh, you can add all your flavor to that. What this basically will do is add a nice sheen and a snap to the outside. So we basically will use this for garnishes uh, or coating chocolates and things like that or truffles. And can I use chocolate in savory dishes too? Oh, for sure. You can use chocolate in barbecue sauces. You can actually garnish uh, certain things with chocolate as well. And uh, today we have some strawberries here. You do, yeah. If you want to hand me those, yep. we can start dipping those. For sure. You just want to grab one of those and just stick it in. Give it a little twist. So what this is going to do is it's actually going to... And this uh, actually looks so good. Uh, and for today's recipe, recipe, please join us at natenewswatch.ca and click on the second edition tab. Thanks for joining us. It was better than the in vitro food machine we have. What makes a video viral? Well, the earlier it's released in the week, the more time it has to gain momentum. And the shorter the video, the better. Especially since the average human being only has an attention span of eight seconds. And of, co of course, content makes all the difference. Let's check in with Lisa. Hello, science lovers. For this week's viral video, I'm gonna show you a really cool, easy science experiment all it involves is milk, food coloring, and dish soap. Milk. Two colors of food coloring. And... Soap. Now four colors. I think Andrea and Michaela have completed their experiment. Hmm, let's take a look. And 
Sandra, what are you doing? Oh, I just saw the movie Weird Science, Michaela, and now I'm trying to make a boyfriend. Can I have one too? Of course! What? Making a girl. The 1985 Actually cult classic, Weird Science, follows two high school nerds, played by Anthony Michael Hall and Elin Mitchell Smith. They desperately want girlfriends and have their eyes on the girls of their two bullies. They determine every proportion from magazines and even her intelligence and personality using Wyatt's computer to design her. Gary and Wyatt put their heads together to create every teenage boy's unattainable dream woman. Then, some weird science happens and their creation, who they name Lisa, is brought- it's whom, Michaela? Is brought to life when lightning strikes! What would you little maniacs like to do first? Throughout the movie, Lisa causes a lot of trouble for the boys, and a lot of weird things happen. <laughs> the bullies get jealous of Wyatt and Gary, and even their crushes start paying attention to them. Lisa definitely gets them all the attention they ever wanted. And definitely weird. Hi, dudes. I'm so good. In the end, Gary and Wyatt get everything they ever wanted. Confidence and girlfriends. It's purely sexual. <laughs> this movie does have its funny moments, I gotta say. But the language can be a little offensive sometimes. Overall, I do like the movie and the message that it's putting out that you should always be yourself and confident, even if you are a nerd. <laughs> I give this movie three fake boyfriends out of five. And I definitely agree with Andra. The graphics are kind of weird but so is the 80s. I also give this movie three fake boyfriends out of five. <laughs> Looks like we're experts on creating a show now. Like professors Jeanette, Stu, Perry, and Chris? Even better.